Hi everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar, focusing on leveraging the Three Shape Trios 3 Basic Intro Oral Scanner to begin and grow a digitally driven practice. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. If at any point during the presentation you have questions, please type them into the questions section of your control panel and we'll be sure to cover them at the end of the webinar. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large computer applications are closed to ensure a smooth connection. This webinar is presented by Henry Shine Dental and 3Shape, and no CE credits are being offered for attending this presentation. Our speaker today is Narain Rajan. Dr. Rajan has been involved with digital techniques in dentistry since 2007 and now focuses on optimizing intraoral scanning and digital workflows in restorative practices. He has lectured extensively, both nationally and internationally, on this topic, so we are certainly looking forward to the next hour. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, for being here today, and we look forward to your insightful presentation. Well, thank you very much. Just going to get started here. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I'm Dr. Narain Rajan, so thank you very much, um, Adam. Um, we're going to have a good time for the next 45 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to talk about today is getting started with the TRIOS basic and growing a digitally different practice and really getting started with a digital mindset to your practice. You see, things we really only imagined being able to do in our practices just a few years ago uh, are now fully possible because technology has really caught up with our needs as clinicians. And it's really not only for early adopters or uh, let's say elite clinicians anymore. Uh, it really is for every dentist every day. And by the end of the webinar, uh, my hope is that you really see a, a very clear way on how to get started, but then also how to move forward as your uh, skills uh, and your interest grows in this field. So I've done these types of presentations on behalf of 3Shape, uh, as well as Henry Schein, the Seattle Study Club, uh, as well as Strauman. So really how this story starts is that Digital technology in dentistry uh, and has really moved beyond what we considered same day types of workflows. Years ago, if we wanted to use digital technology in our practices, it was really relegated to same day CAD CAM type of, of systems. And, and today, it's really grown beyond same day so that in the past, if I wanted to be involved with using technology, using intraoral scanners, uh, it was really with my same day CAD CAM systems. And for everything else, um, it, it was really necessary for me to uh, rely on the tried and true analog techniques. And really, that was because when these technologies started, we primarily had closed systems. And what closed systems meant is that we didn't have a lot of choice as far as what scanner we had, what uh, software we were using and, and what mills that uh, we were using to manufacture. And in these workflows on day one, the clinician was actually um, responsible for uh, all of these uh, parts of the process. Um, and they may not have been involved with this before going into a digital system. So that, that includes imaging and the design and manufacturing as well as post-processing. Um, but we all know that when we start with new technology, especially computerized technology, you can see even here uh, that you know you get some uh, little uh, kind of roadblocks, and uh, you tend to stumble a little bit when you're when you're doing things uh, for the first time. And we all need to learn to crawl before we can walk, walk before we can run, and run before we can fly. And my feeling, uh, being an early same day CAD CAM user, was that I really needed to be able to fly on day one. Otherwise, um, the, the actual workflows of the technology may not work for me uh, in my practice. And really one of the main differences over the past, uh, I would say five years, is that a lot of the systems have gone open. And what open systems mean is that we have choices now. We have choices of what intraoral scanner that we get. We have choices of what manufacturing technology and, and what uh, CAD CAM design software that we're using, but we also have choice now as to what the rate of implementation is. Um, in essence, we have the ability now to, to start small and then scale. And so when we talk about today about what is a crawling phase when you get started 
with digital technology, it's getting started with an intraoral scanner like the TRIOS 3 Basic. And we don't recommend starting with a very complicated case. Uh, I lecture a lot about this, and, and a lot of times doctors are asking, can I do full arch cases? Can I do complicated um, aesthetic types of cases? And I said, yes, you absolutely can, but you shouldn't start there. So we always recommend to start with basic operation. Start by doing diagnostic scans on all of your patients and really getting comfortable with the strategy of scanning, um, the using the, the software that comes with the system and navigating it and really integrating the, using the scanner into your daily practice. And very soon after that, that's not gonna take a long time, maybe a, a week or two, start using it for your routine cases. So we're talking about our one and two unit cases. And really, um, this allows you to really get used to things and then you can start and scale from there. As you start to really get comfortable with, with the workflows, you have the ability to then get started with the non-restorative workflows. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that down the line because that's not actually what comes with your basic system, but this is when you can employ smile design, implant planning, your three plus units, removable appliances. We're really using it for all of those things. And when you really get to be a master, then you can do your own CAD design, your own printing, your own milling. Um, your complex and the full arts cases. So that will come as well. And um, you know, th this is what it kind of looks like. This is kind of the timeline of uh, learning digital dentistry in your office. And you're allowed to be a beginner. You don't have to learn this in the first year. In fact, I think it can take you know, three plus years to really get to a point where you're really comfortable um, using a lot of the technologies there. So can it digitally impression teeth with accuracy? In fact, when I first started uh, with um, looking for a scanner, and this was about five years ago, um, coming out of, I actually used same day systems up to 12 years ago. I went back to analog, um, and about five years ago, I wanted to see how I can get back into scanning. And when I was doing that, this was the only question that I really had to ask. Um, but what's happened now is that the scanner is becoming much more than just impression material. Uh, you have to look at so many more metrics. So not only is the scanner accurate, uh, but what is the delivery system? Is it an open or a closed system? Are there diagnostic features to the scanner? How fast can you scan? Can you map shade? Is it wired or wireless? Does it come with a laptop or a big cart? So that you have a lot more choices to make these days. Um, and when I made that choice five years ago, I, I ended up going with a three-shape trios. And um, really, we got started with scanning. And really, what I want you to understand is that we want to actually challenge what the conventional thinking of what these scanners are used to do. Um, when we get started with this, this brings up the concept of the four Ts. And I want you guys to think about all of the technology that we have in our field now. And what do we use this technology for? Why do we use it? And in our practice, what we've learned is that the technology is really just a tool so that we can bring transparency uh, to our practice and our patients. We're beyond the time where patients um, just believe what we say, in my opinion, and we have to really show them what's happening. And this is how I use my intraoral scanner to create transparency. The quicker that I can create transparency with my patients, um, the quicker that uh, I'm gonna establish trust with them. And this is something that we all have to uh, do with our patients on a daily basis, uh, the new patients and our existing patients. The sooner that we can create trust with our patients, the more easily it's gonna be for us to actually present treatment and to execute treatment for those patients. And that's been the overwhelming theme uh, of me using these systems for the last four or five years, actually. And it really goes to this um, idea of starting with why. Simon Sinek wrote a great book about this, about really defining why you're doing something more than just how or what you're doing it. And for me, using the intraoral scanner, the TRIOS basic, um, the first thing is to connect with our patients. So a lot of times people are wondering, you use these scanners to make a crown, to send to the laboratory, it's actually the last thing that I use my scanner for is to do the restorative portion of treatment. Um, the first thing I use it for is to connect with my patients. Uh, and I'm gonna share a little bit, these are pictures of my own operatory in my office. 
And uh, a lot of it starts with the comprehensive exam. We all do these comprehensive exams for our new patients when they come in. And um, to speak a little bit about the journey that I took is that uh, five years ago, we decided to do all of our new patient examinations uh, in the doctor schedule uh, instead of the hygiene schedule. This was a choice that I had made um, based on a lot of continuing education that I had taken. And, um, and about three years ago, we decided to make this TRIO scan a prominent feature of this first visit. And by making it a prominent feature of the first visit, we are able to create connection um, and transparency and trust with our patients much faster uh, is what I noticed. The way that we did this is that uh, we weren't doing this initially. In fact, when we first got our scanner, uh, it um, came with a laptop and we put it on a cart behind the patient. The patient didn't really see what we were doing on a routine basis. Uh, and then what we actually did is a couple of years later, we got a very simple uh, HDMI switcher uh, from Amazon. It was a $14 or $15 um, item. We wired that to the big TV that you can see uh, that I always had in my operatory. And now I can, with a push of a button, I can stream everything that's happening on my laptop onto the big screen. All of a sudden, patients are seeing their own teeth being built. And all of a sudden, it's transparent. They know that this is their teeth. And they start asking questions, actually. So, And that's really what we want to do as clinicians, at least what I want is I want my patients to ask questions about their mouth and their conditions uh, so that I can give them some answers, hopefully. We also found that as we started doing this and um, we made these scans a prominent feature, we started to be able to actually do all of the things that we wanted to do or needed to do on a comprehensive exam um, all of those things were augmented by having the scan. For example, uh, what you can't see is my assistant. She's right off to the right side of the screen. And she's basically writing down the charting and whatnot while I'm interviewing the patient, getting to know them and answering their, their, um, their questions. I leave the scan up on the big TV. And um, she can see you know, tooth number three is missing. Tooth number four um, has an implant or it has a crown. And the way that a lot of these new technologies work is that they work on centralized software platforms. And the centralized software platform for us is called Dental Desktop. And this is where all of our scans are stored, but also where we can then do other things. And we'll talk about patient excitement apps at the end and, and how you can grow beyond just the, uh, using the TRIOS basic. But Dental Desktop is the platform that everything is centralized on. And so these are some of the excitement apps that we will talk about towards the end of the presentation of how you can really leverage uh, the benefits of all the software and all of the things that is really bespoke to 3Shape to really help us in what we do every day. Um, but every scanner, and the TRIOS 3 Basic has this as well, has tools for restorative analysis. And these are the tools that are included for our restorative workflows. So we can, for instance, if we're going to scan for a crown, uh, we have built-in shade measurement. We can uh, make notes to our technician for certain you know, lab, lab procedures. Uh, we can actually measure the occlusal clearance, and we can make sure that we've prepared enough tooth structure. Uh, we have the ability to look at undercuts to see if we um, have path of draw issues. But I'm going to show you that even at um, an initial visit when I'm creating the connection and the experience for the patient, uh, we actually use all of these tools in kind of a diagnostic and an educational way. And I'd like to show you how. Um, the more continu continuing education I've taken uh, and the more time I spent with these comprehensive exams over the last couple of years is I discovered that many of my patients were presenting with some kind of occlusal aspect um, to their presentation, whether it was in the muscles or it was in the teeth. And I always found that it was difficult to create connection and experience around occlusal findings uh, for, for patients. Hard to make them understand you know, what was happening, why it was happening, and what we could do to fix it. Um, but I'm going to show you how we use some of these restore, restorative analysis tools that's included with every TRIO system to really help us with patients. And it kind of works like this. It's, it's um, a matter of combining analog techniques with digital techniques. So if in my comprehensive exam, I discover that the patient has 
uh, some kind of occlusal component, maybe they're complaining that their bite is off or something is not even, we'll actually just take our traditional um, bite marking ribbon the, with, with red and blue, just like we learned. Uh, we would basically use the red to create all the excursive movements. You ask the patient to rub on red every which way, and then you have them come out, you have them tap on the blue, tap, tap, tap. Um, and, and basically there you have all the marks that we're trained to, to, to read um, and to diagnose. Then I take the trio scan. And so now you can see all of the marks and the patient sees what we actually did. Uh, and it's combined with the intraoral scan. And now we can actually take our digital bite scan, which is part of um, our basic scanning workflows. And we can look at the digital heat map of where the teeth are contacting. And what's interesting is, it, in a very easy way, we actually have the ability um, to compare what we did analog and what the computer is reading. And when we first started doing this, it's pretty neat because we can actually account for just about every analog mark that we made with the digital heat map. And so right away now, we know that we have a level of accuracy and precision with this information that we're seeing on the screen. So how do we use it to actually uh, treat and help a patient. So <clears throat> one of the patients last year came in and she said, ever since my dentist placed an onlay on tooth number 15, um, I can't chew. And she said, um, I went back to my dentist, he made some adjustments, I'm not sure what he was doing, but I still can't bite on my tooth. And um, so we said, okay, let's take a look. And we applied this protocol. We did our analog bite marking, then we scanned it with the trios and we shared this with the patient on that same monitor that you saw. Uh, from my operatory, uh, and then we did the digital bite scanning, and you can see that the marks came up with this. Uh, and then in the next screen, we were really able to identify, basically what I saw is I found a non-working balancing contact. She had an interference right on that onlay. And maybe it was just that the other dentist didn't know how to really mark it to be able to see it. Um, you have to dry the teeth very well if you're gonna do this. We, we actually use tissue paper for this. So the point of this was I didn't come up with a novel way uh, to come up with um, an occlusal diagnosis, but I basically repackaged it with connection and experience into a visual kind of experience that the patient could see. I could explain to her that we're not only just grinding in there kind of you know haphazardly, but we're using a very um, uh, distinct protocol and said, you know, this is the area where I think your problem is coming from. And what happened was after two or three days, I took that little uh, area that is marked in blue away and she started to feel better. She could chew on the tooth. And essentially it goes back to this, is that we used the technology to create transparency and we got trust with this patient. And we can basically build credibility with our patients much easier when we use the technology to actually help them understand what's happening in their mouths. And, and you all can do this with any basic system. It's very important as you get started with your trios that there's a very specific way to build the scan. So these scanners are very much like taking a panoramic photo with your iPhone. That little yellow line that you see on your iPhone is the scan strategy. And the scan strategy for building an accurate intraoral scan with your trios is, is listed on the slide here. The upper scan strategy starts with the occlusal, you turn to the buckle, and then you do that S-shaped kind of motion to capture the palate. Uh, and the lower is similar, but a little different. We do the occlusal, the lingual, and then the buccal. And when you first start doing this, or let's say you take, um, let's say you go off of the scan strategy when you're doing a panoramic photo, the system is still picking up images, but you can see very clearly where we went off of the scan path. And um, very similarly, the scanner can do the same thing. So unless you're capturing the data in the right way, you may be seeing images come up on the screen, but they may not be 100% accurate. So it's very important when you get started in that crawling phase to get very good at that scan strategy. That will build uh, and create a lot of accuracy and precision for everything you do with the scanner down the line. And as you start to get some, some experience with this, you'll find that you start getting very much better, just like with an iPhone. And if you follow the proper scan strategy for an iPhone, you see uh, that the picture gets a lot clearer. But we want to reduce the lear learning curve. And that's one of the really neat things about uh, the three shape system is that they're helping us with their software to make this learning curve much faster to make sure that the scans 
uh, are accurate. And the analog with an iPhone panoramic photo is using a gyroscopic gimbal. So I took this same panoramic photo with my gyroscopic gimbal, and now I don't have to do anything. You can see me, I'm just holding my hand steady, and the software and the gyroscopes are taking a much better scan strategy than I ever could. And when you look at that photograph, that's actually a very clear photograph. It's probably the most crisp. And the idea here is that AI scanning is, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence um, powered scanning that comes with all of, uh, with every Trio scanner. Um, it allows you to scan quickly and the system is automatically removing the unwanted features. So it knows that you want to capture the teeth and it helps you cut out the lips and the cheek and the tongue. Uh, and we found that this is very useful to get really good scanning very quickly. And how do we know that that is the, the most accurate scan strategy? Uh, well, they, they've studied this. This article came out in Quintessence uh, about four years ago this year. And um, they looked at all the different scan strategies and they actually validated the one that is published, that that is actually the most accurate way um, to create uh, a proper scan uh, and uh, an accurate scan. So there's some best practices that's very important for any new user getting started with this technology. And as far as positioning in the room, I do that many different ways as well. There's times that I'm standing and I have the laptop be behind me and a lot of time it's simulcast so that I can also see it on the screen that's on the wall. There are times that I'm sitting um, there's times that I'm sitting and I'm facing the back of the room. And so it helps to have that kind of um, IT setup in your room where you have multiple monitors that are streamed so that during a procedure, say you're scanning for crowns, you don't have to crane your neck back at certain positions. You can just look to the other wall and you have it there or you can scan uh, at the 12 o'clock um, position as well. And so you, you'll kind of find what are the most comfortable ways to actually you know, uh, position yourself and the patient. And as you're scanning, one of the other things is what do you do with your other hand? What do you do with the soft tissues? So it's very important that as you're building the scan, you're slowly advancing, your finger is a little bit ahead of the scanner uh, to kind of help the system. We have AI scanning now, but it also helps to have uh, a specific technique to be able to build the scans very easily with the least amount of images. And so these are just some screenshots of a video that it took. And you'll find that even when, when you do this, you may end up with small areas of missing data. And a lot of times it happens on the upper, um, in the posterior areas, you, you may miss that. And this is kind of the position that you need to do to kind of get that area, have the patient close down a little bit, move their mandible. And, and you can really rotate the scanner. You can actually apply a fair amount of pressure on the mandibular ramus to get those missing areas and the patients don't feel it, it's not painful, you should try it on your own mouth. One of the things that we also like to recommend is that um, you can use retractors, like this one is made by Ibuclar, it's called the Optrigate, and that's a very useful technique as you're getting started to kind of keep everything out of the way so that you're starting to really just master what you're doing with the scanner. Uh, but the truth is today I can create a very quick scan using uh, the Optrigate or just using um, my hands and my fingers. It's all about predictability and that's one of the main things that we want to stress with as you get started with this kind of technology you get to experience predictability in dentistry to a level that maybe you haven't experienced before. Um, in the past if I was going to see a patient uh, like Janine here uh, she came in and she said um, I want to have crowns on my two central incisors number eight and nine and uh, I don't want you to treat number seven and 10. And I want you to make these teeth exactly the way that they are now. And um, most patients don't know all the tooth numbers, but Janine happened to be my hygienist. And so my own hygienist asked me uh, to do crowns on her front teeth. You may be wondering why. Uh, well, she had large interproximal uh, fillings over years. She was, uh, she was starting to clench. She was starting to get chipping. And she wanted me to do this, but she wouldn't let me do anything else. And in the past, it might have been difficult to maybe promise that I would be able to get the teeth exactly the way that they were. But one of the things today is that when we start and finish, you know, um, the beginning and the end point are very similar, whether you're doing analog dentistry or digital dentistry. The advantage to using the digital techniques is that we really know where we are in the process at any given point. So we already know how it's gonna go. 
Um, and that's really been one of the biggest benefits uh, that makes this very enjoyable. So every case that we do, whether it's a single tooth, two teeth, or a full arch of teeth, we always turn on this option in our dental desktop that says pre-preparation scan. This allows us to digitally scan the preoperative condition of whatever we're doing. Sometimes I do it even if I know I'm gonna change it, but I'm definitely gonna do it for a patient like Janine, where I know I wanna recreate this. I wanna communicate the exact contours of these teeth to my laboratory so that they can copy mill it, and we wanna make a monolithic crown for her. The next thing that we do is we used our trios to actually measure the shade. The best area to take the shade is in the mid-labial area. And it actually showed uh, up to be a 2M1, uh, the trios was reading. And we checked it with the photograph and sure enough, 2M1 was right in the, um, the, the shade range that would look appropriate for her. We then, um, we always make prep guides. So one of the things that I could tell you, one of the tips is that Getting one of these scanners doesn't make you a better dentist, and digital dentistry doesn't make you a better dentist. It makes you become a better dentist, if you can follow that. And it makes you really critically see what you're doing in a way that you couldn't do before. Um, if you're going to make a monolithic copy milled restoration, you have to make sure that you're giving the laboratory the proper amount of clearance. And if you've ever had a laboratory ask you to do a reduction coping on an anterior tooth, it's probably in that facial third. And so we still use these prep guides and we check it and we make sure that we have the proper amount of reduction with the proper planes of reduction. And then we get a dentin shade. Today we can actually measure the dentin shade with the trios and uh, it has a couple of popular uh, dentin shade um, manufacturer scales that are built into the system. Uh, so if you forget to do this sometimes, you can actually go back, it's actually embedded into the scan. Um, when you overlay the silhouette of the preoperative um, teeth to the preparation that you've made, you really want to create uh, smooth finish lines, you want to create uniform reduction with rounded internal line angles, and um, seeing it on a big screen, you really kind of forces you to maybe make your preparations better. Mine certainly got better uh, a couple of years ago when I saw my preparations on a big screen. Uh, so it was really an opportunity to improve as a clinician, and that really increases the predictability as well. Uh, and so we know right away here that this is going to be a successful situation for the laboratory. We're going to arm them with the, with the proper information to be able to give us back something that the patient is going to be happy with. And that is exactly what we did here. We had uh, two monolithic Emax crowns. There was, only, um, there was only coloring and staining here. There was no layering. Um, and this is a very happy patient. It was, and, and a lot of times patients think that crowns are not going to look natural. Um, and when they said that to this hygienist, she would always say, well, you, do you like the way that these two front teeth look? Uh, you know, he actually, he did them using some of this new technology that we have. So it's really been uh, a growth center for us, um, both professionally and um, uh, really as a dentist. This was uh, the before, we have an after, uh, and there's a two-year post up here as well. Um, the single units is really what I do really on a, on a daily basis. It's really still the bread and butter, and, and this is where it gets really efficient. And so today, when we do a single unit, we don't simply give anesthesia and see the patient and go do something else, like an exam, or we go back to our desk. We literally start scanning. So we see the patient, we give them anesthesia, we start scanning. I'll do the upper, the lower, and the bite. Today, what I would tell you is to scan the whole arch. We can then um, select the shade. We can have the patient do the bite before they've been open for an hour, an hour, hour and a half. So that later on, all I need to do is cut out that one tooth. In this case, we're, uh, we're showing the example as tooth number 19. And so that all I have to do at the end of the procedure is to literally just scan in that one tooth. And we do this whether it's one tooth or 10 teeth. It really makes it very efficient and it's very accurate as well. So, some of the best practices is that the scanner can't see through tissue, it can't see through blood, it can't see through saliva. So it's still very important for us to create proper tissue retraction. Now, I still prefer to do uh, two cords. Uh, my colleagues that I teach with, Dr. Allen and Dr. Barbara Durham, they like to use a laser. Some of my other colleagues um, use hemostatic paste. I really don't mind what you use as long as you can see the margin the way that you see it here and that the scanner can pick it up. Um, this is what the double cord technique looks like. When you take it out, the designer really needs to be able to see 
all the way around. Uh, one of the differences from analog is that there's no little bleb of stone there that the laboratory can chip off. If the tissue is covering the margin, there will be an issue and you need to go back. You're gonna see it because you have on-site validation before you hit the send button to go back and just, you can cut that one little area out and stitch it back in without starting from, uh, from step one. And that's really another great advantage to getting started with this. When you look at a properly uh, retracted preparation, it kind of looks like this. And you can see my margin all the way around. To improve the predictability, I also encourage to, to slightly um, adjust the contact points. And this really helps the laboratory and their digital design uh, parameters to get your contacts just right. Uh, and you can turn the scan over and invert it and look at it like an impression as well. Uh, and this is really how today, a lot of times we don't have models for one or two units. We really just get a crown in a box and we deliver it to the patient. Many times we're making very minimal adjustments. Uh, it makes it very satisfying. When you look at partial coverage, it's the same story. You know, it's really creating very smooth surfaces. Uh, we can we can take intraoral pictures. The, what you see on the right there is actually an intraoral picture taken with the trios, um, and it's kind of overlaid onto the scan. Um, and you can see here that we can make milled onlays or we can make pressed onlays. So this happened to be a case where they actually used the digital data uh, to create a wax pattern. Uh, they used the wax pattern and then they basically pressed it. And here's what the fit looks like with some of these um, trios um, restorative procedures. This is the onlay just tried in with no cement. And in my earlier days dealing with some other CAD CAM systems, we didn't always appreciate this kind of a fit. Um, and it really is there today where we can get an imperceptible margin. We get very, very precise fits with these, with these restorations. Another thing that you're going to do right off the bat is use the scanner um, to scan for implants, right? Don't start with a big, big case. Most scanners are validated up to one to three implants that are not very far apart. Uh, and you're going to use scan bodies, right? So scan bodies are, is the digital analog of an impression coping. Um, and what you need to know is that you can get these scan bodies from the implant manufacturer, but also several third-party manufacturers make scan bodies. And the important point is to ask your laboratory what they need you to use, because what they have on their end works on something called the DME. It's a data management exchange file that corresponds to a specific scan body. So it's very important that you capture your scan with the appropriate scan body for your particular laboratory. 3Shape being an innovative company, they're actually coming out with their own um, range of scan bodies um, that are made of titanium. All of the other ones that you see on the right uh, are made of peak, so it's a plastic type, uh, type material, and many times they recommend single use only. Um, so very soon you'll be able to have um, you know, barcoded titanium scan bodies from 3Shape um, that can be used um, more than one time. Uh, and the barcode actually tells the laboratory what type of implant and what connection it is in case you don't do it properly in the order creation. Uh, so stay, stay tuned for those as well. And basically you use these just like impression copings. You're gonna attach that to the implant and um, you're gonna take a scan. And, and early on when I did this, um, I would wanna validate it with what I was doing with stone models as well. So I would take a scan and I would take a stone, um, uh, a, a traditional PVS, impression. What I wanted to know at that time is I would ask the laboratory to make a, a digital crown and I wanted to see that I could place it on an unsectioned uh, stone stone model with accuracy and and this is what was happening. It was it was very accurate in small areas, very, very accurate. Um, and you can see the fit of this. Uh, this was an aesthetic zirconia uh, screw retain crown and uh, they're really looking good these days. Uh, you can barely see the screw access channels. If you're using um, an implant system where the healing cap itself is also um, an impression coping, you can actually just scan that. Um, and so it makes it very easy. So this is one an early case that we did about five years ago. Um, we made a custom abutment with this case. The laboratory can print the model. They can print uh, the soft tissue layer as well these days. Um, and you can see that when we're scanning the, the shape of the emergence profile, we can connect these abutments. There's very little blanching on the tissue, and a lot of times we're not giving uh, the patient anesthesia for cases like this. Um, and we found very early on that we were getting very, very good fits, um, whether it was a screw, uh, screw retain restoration or uh, a cemented restoration. 
When we look at multiple implants, you can see here it, it's helpful to use implant systems where you don't have to take a PA uh, to confirm the fit into the connection. Um, what, we find it useful to use systems with, that have um, self, um, I would say self-tapping screws so that it doesn't let you put the, um, the, the screw doesn't engage the threads unless the scan body is properly seated because you see here on the right, it's kind of difficult to see, you know, uh, through peak. Um, and this is basically, you know, what these restorations look like. Uh, we did a monolithic screw retained on the first case. There was a custom abutment with a zirconia crown on the second case. Uh, and these are custom abutments with porcelain fused to metal. So the, the point is that once you have these scans, you can use whatever type of restoration that you feel comfortable using. It doesn't change just because you decided to get this scanner. For this particular patient, uh, a couple of years later, the, he, he was actually in need to have um, one, one more implant. And what you can see here is this is the general scanning workflow uh, for a single unit. So we set up an order for pre-preparation. There's another one, it's called emergence profile. Um, we capture the bite. Uh, and all of this is done within a period of, I would say four or five minutes now. Um, you, you can see here that I'm actually scanning the emergence profile. And so this is very um, this is a very popular question as well. Uh, there's no more custom healing uh, or custom impression components. Um, today, we actually captured the bite also. I'll speak to you a little bit about patient-specific motion, but we're recording the actual mandibular movements of this patient. And so everything is digital and it gets onto a screen and our technicians can create uh, restorations that literally just drop in with, with very little adjustment. And you can see what the fit looks like. So those were two different types of implant. One was a tissue level, the other one was a bone level. Um, we also have the ability and with your Trios Basic to combine uh, restorative procedures with implant procedures. Uh, if you imagine doing a case like this before where you have two implants on the right side and maybe two crown preparations on the left side, this would involve either taking two separate impressions I would do that sometimes if uh, the patient was having a hard time with a full arch, or more accurately, you're going to take a big full arch PBS impression for this, which is not really that fun to take uh, for either us or the patient. And today, we can capture all of this on the scan. In fact, you do your pre-preparation scan. You capture most of the data before you actually scan. One tip for, for, for when you actually do get started with this is not to actually capture the crown preparation margins, the crown scan, um, until you're scanning the emergence profile. Um, so it's important to capture crown preparations on the emergence profile scan. Uh, and then the last thing we do is we connect the scan bodies and um, we can capture the, the impression. This is what we got back from the lab from this case. It was a printed model. They printed the soft tissue. We have two different types of, uh, of, uh, of crown restorations here. The natural teeth were done in uh, monolithic zirconia, um, and the bicuspids were done as uh, screw-retained porcelain fused to metal. Um, and you could see here that when we brought this patient back and we inserted it in, into the patient's mouth, in fact, the only area that I adjusted on this case was the palatal cusp of tooth number 14. So we really validated that this is an accurate thing to do, and it makes it really fun um, for both the both the dentist and the patient. The last section I want to talk to you about is that what you can use your basic scanner to do is there's a lot of interesting workflows with dentures. Now, anybody out there doing dentures, some people don't like them. I particularly do like to do them. I'll show you a little bit about how I'm leveraging the scanner with a lot of traditional basic dental um, denture workflows. So you may have a patient with an immediate denture that you made or maybe you have a patient with a clinically acceptable denture that you want to duplicate. And when we were taught in dental school, a lot of times um, it would be difficult to duplicate this denture and get a new denture with the same position of teeth. A lot of times we were just kind of starting over uh, and letting the patient know we we're going to do our best to copy it. But today we can use our scanner to actually scan these dentures um, and really communicate to the laboratory um, how to make them. And uh, there's the technique. Uh, to basically hold the denture in your hand and scan it. It was made um, popular by Dr. Valerie McMillan. She's a prosthodontist from Ohio. She calls this the cupcake technique. You can find it on YouTube. Um, and it works very well. Basically, you hold the scanner and you move the denture in your hand. You basically rotate the denture in your hand. And this is the scan strategy 
to scanning a denture. You start on the on the intaglio side, right where the palatal rugae are. The scanner starts getting images very quickly, and you move in concentric circles around that midpoint. And you can see here, after I capture the intaglio side, as slowly I'm just turning the scanner, um, turning the denture in my hand. The scanner is static. And then we capture the teeth. And one of the tricks is if this doesn't work on the first try to cancel the whole scan and do the whole thing again, you want one fluid scan stream when you, when you do this. And it's very important that uh, you put the denture back in the mouth to actually create the bite registration. You want to resist the, if you have two dentures that uh, hand articulate, you don't want to just kind of scan them in your hands. You want to put them back in the patient to get the most accurate bite recording that you can. And here's a case where it was just like that. It was basically the patient had immediate dentures on the upper and the lower. Uh, we basically scanned it in our hands. We scanned the bite. You can even see my visco gel um, on the intaglio there. And we sent this to the laboratory. And the laboratory um, can do a couple of things now for you. You can print that whole thing as a monoblock. And that's what we did in this example here is that we just printed a monoblock of the upper and the lower. Um, and then it's very easy to bring the patient back and to basically try this in. This becomes uh, your custom tray. It becomes your try-in. Um, you can make any changes for your records visit. In this case, we're really not going to because we basically duplicated exactly what the patient had. Now I use this as my custom tray and create a wash impression. And this goes back to the laboratory. And they can actually use everything that's in here to duplicate that denture. Um, I'm going to show you one more case where maybe you're making a partial denture. Um, and partial dentures can be um, challenging in cases like this where you have a distal extension. Maybe you have a patient that has a lot of uh, bone loss from previous periodontal disease. Taking an impergum impression for a case like this can be challenging. But today what we do is we combine our techniques, like I was talking about with the occlusion part of this. I use my scanner to basically pick up all of the hard tissues. I don't have to put wax in between all these embrasures. I try to get to the contralateral retro, uh, retromolar pad. Uh, and then basically the laboratory prints this model and they're gonna create um, a framework. Now this was a conventionally produced framework. So refractory uh, cast, um, they, they invested it, lost wax technique. Um, there's also ways to make it digitally. Uh, but in this case, it was a conventional um, fabrication they sent it back with a wax try-in like this. And you can see here uh, right, right away that you get really good fits on uh, these frameworks from intraoral scans for your partial dentures. And um, we actually blend some of the workflows. Some of you might remember something called an altered cast technique that we use in dental school because basically I have everything but that distal extension area recorded. Um, and if I want to actually create that that uh, border extension, a, a functional impression. It's very easy that uh, on the second visit when you try this in, you create a little 30 second putty in that area. Uh, you send it back to the laboratory and they do the split cast technique uh, with a printed model even. So now the stone portion has uh, all of the, the soft tissue features that we want to have. Uh, it has the extension of um, the base that we want. I've related the hard tissue to the soft tissue, everything that we were taught in school, except it's made a lot easier uh, because I'm augmenting it with the scanner. And so this is how that case ended up being. Um, so you can see it has a, a, a full functional extension. And on the left, if you see, if I didn't do that border molding step, we would have had a margin that looked a lot shorter. The patient may have had food impaction. So these were really just a bunch of things to get you started. When you have a Trios Basic, you can do everything that I just showed you um, within your first year, I think. I don't think there's anything there that anybody out there couldn't do within the first year. Um, so we talked about starting and scaling. Well, how about scaling after starting? So what happens after? You have the opportunity to actually upgrade your Trios Basic when you're ready to start doing and taking advantage of a lot of other things that 3Shape offers. So what we've done so far is I recommend trio scanning every new patient. Remember the four T's to create transparency, trust, and treatment. Master your trio's best practices and use the trios for more predictable restorative results, whether it's uh, your implants, removable, your routine crown and bridge. Those are the crawling and walking phases. 
the running and flying phases have to do with the software, and that has to, um, and that's actually built into our dental desktop as well. So at any point, you can actually upgrade your system. It's a software update, and now you can use things like smile design and patient monitoring and implant planning. This monitoring software is incredibly useful. That we're, we've been using it about a year, and now we we actually have a way now to actually create digital libraries because we're scanning every patient and we try to do it once a year, we basically create a timeline of scans and the three shape patient monitoring app basically aligns all of those scans and allows us to make a little movie of how our patients are changing over time. And so it makes it much easier to explain to them why maybe they should consider doing treatment. Um, we can track gum recession like I'm showing you on this patient. Um, this patient came in and uh, we she ended up going for gingival grafting surgery and many times we um, if you're a general practitioner, you're going to send to maybe your periodontist colleagues to do root coverage surgery. Um, and now we actually have an objective way to actually measure what the results of our root coverage surgery are. So we're not only using these techniques to actually show the patient that their teeth are wearing or their gums are receding or the teeth are shifting. Um, we can actually, by comparing serial scans, we can actually measure um, the efficacy and the results of some of our treatments. And so this was on the left, you see uh, the preoperative scan and on the right was after uh, the um, uh, gingival grafting for this patient. Patient monitoring will automatically align those scans. And now I can make a digital heat map. You can literally see exactly what the changes were from before and after the surgery. And one of the greatest things about being able to really look at this data and measure it is that we can take a 3D data set and we can make cross section. Now laboratories already do this all the time in their CAD software. Now we have the opportunity to look at clinical data on our patients in the same way. So one of the big concepts of 3D dentistry is actually cutting it into 2D sections. And I'll show you how we can now take that same patient that had gingival grafting and we can then share with our colleagues, maybe our specialist colleagues, or if we did it ourselves, that hey, we had two millimeters of root coverage in the area of number five, and we had actually 2.1 in area number six. It's, it becomes clear as day, because we have data to, to actually look at and, and sort of analyze for our patients. A lot of times you may have patients coming in and saying that, hey, I think my bite has changed. If you're scanning every patient and you're able to actually do patient monitoring, you can answer a lot of these questions right in, in your hygiene room. So, you, so this patient came in, she said, my, I feel like I'm biting my front teeth more than I used to. And I can, I can in a few minutes, tell her that, um, yeah, your, your bite has changed. Your, your front centrals are about a quarter millimeter different than they used to be. We never had these tools. And this is really where transparency and trust comes in for patients. You may have another patient like this who came in swearing that that lower front tooth, tooth number 26, never stuck out the way that it uh, did now. Now I knew that it looked exactly the same way when she came in, but the fact is now I had data and I could prove it to her. So I basically said, let's figure it out right now. Here's, let's take a scan. And in fact, that tooth that she thought was sticking out so much, it was within 0 0.05 millimeters of where it was two years ago from her initial new patient scan. And that was it, that was the end of the story. She, we were able to actually address this question and without this technology, she wouldn't have believed me if I told her that no, your bite has not changed. That's exactly how we use patient-specific motion as well. And so we put this on the big screen, patients that swear that they don't clench and that they don't grind. It's very easy to kind of show them. And this is kind of the future of what you can upgrade to as time goes on. And the laboratories use that file that comes out of the specific motion, and they actually incorporate it into their digital designs for your crown. So you're gonna have more predictability. That's kind of how we get a crown in a box and it goes right into the patient, because I'm not spending a lot of time making all these adjustments with excursive movements and things like this. Um, but we also have the opportunity to monitor patients for oral pathology. This patient came in, and I had done these two crowns on the upper central. She came back a month or two later with this lesion on her palate, asking me whether it was there when she came in to have the crowns. And so um, without making it a long point, make every scan a full art scan. It was really great to be able to go back and show this patient that um, th that lesion wasn't there when you came in two months ago. It's, it, I, they don't have to believe me, it's transparent, it's right there. Um, and it really helps with um, documentation. You don't know what you're gonna use these scans for down the line. So create your libraries. 
Um, so mo monitoring is a huge thing. So scanning used to be something that we only did for treatment. Now it's something that we do for diagnosis, and it really is becoming something that we use for long-term patient management as well. Uh, we use it for smile design as well. Uh, smile design is becoming a real diagnostic procedure for us where we create um, basically uh, templates for patients. It's, it's a way to educate them. Um, we do a lot of photography in our practice because of this. Uh, uh, my partners, Dr. Allen and Dr. Barber, have a, 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 a bona fide photo studio in their office. Um, I basically have a hallway behind my main operatory where we can create really nice studio style portraits. And we have the ability to use really good cameras. You can see you want to take good pictures so that you can zoom in uh, and you can actually show the patients. Uh, you know, here you can zoom in so much you can see the reflection of the soft boxes in my pupils. And, you know, smile design basically um, involves basically just aligning these two photos, very easy software um, alignment of the two photos, and you can actually create. Uh, a digital design and you get to be artistic. You can look at different smile libraries. You can add color and texture to this and really imagine what the, uh, the new smile is going to look like. And this has really improved our case acceptance, something I was not really able to do really well on my own um, using the technology to sort of do this now. You know, guided, um, guided implants is also another thing. It's very, um, uh, there's a product called Implant Studio. And what Implant Studio really does is uh, it allows you a way to communicate with your laboratory with native files. And so if you think about the way that we plan implants, a lot of times we have one team that's doing the implant, another team that's doing the actual abutment and crown. And as you uh, move, move on, you may want to actually get into your own implant planning. Uh, as a non-surgical GP, now I actually do all of my own implant planning. Um, and it makes it very easy because we have the ability now to communicate with our laboratories and our teams, and we have the ability to really um, bring these files into the design software, make um, uh, custom healing abutments. Uh, we print these guides, and we print these um, uh, we print these right in the office, actually. Uh, and it's giving us predictability that we didn't have before because we can actually create specific soft tissue profiles. So there's a lot of things that you can do as time goes on, but you really start with the basics uh, as I was showing you. And so basically, you know, we could talk about this all day, but the beauty of all of these systems is being able to have more choice than you ever had before. The beauty is that a lot of it becomes a reflection of what you like to do as a practitioner. I've showed you just a quick example of things that I like to do. It really shows you that there's new ways to do things so that you can share with your friends, you can share with your colleagues, uh, and really have more fun with what you're doing. And um, one of my favorite quotes is from Dr. Martin Luther King, and, and he once said, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. And when I bought my first TRIO scanner, it was kind of the first step to go up this big staircase of all these new things that are possible. And um, it's been an incredible journey for me in my practice that's, um, that's, that's still going on to this day. Um, if there's anybody who wants to know exactly how we're doing this, you know, our passion as educators um, is to teach you how to do this. And so we actually have an, uh, an educational academy in New York called CAD Pro Academy. And we specialize in peer-to-peer -peer education to actually show you how to do this. this uh, we found that basic training is very good to get started with this. Um, but we love to actually share this with small groups of dentists. We specialize in peer-to-peer -peer education, uh, multiple day kind of formats where everything is hands-on and you see you know, that's the case that I was showing you as well. Uh, so if this is something that you're interested in, please come and um, visit us at cadproacademy.com. These are my uh, social media handles. If you follow me at, at Dr. Uh, Rajan DMD, you'll see a lot of my content I post on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, to give you tips, education, motivation, and ideas. Um, and with that, um, the whole, I think I went a few minutes over, but I, I hope you could appreciate that there's a breadth of information uh, and possibilities um, with using the three-shape system. So for anybody who's thinking about it, um, we're, we're going to have Adam come back on, um, and we're going to have some time for question and answer as well. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you for that action-packed 
55 minutes. Um, we do have a couple questions, and if anyone else does have questions, please feel free to type them into the questions tab, and we'll try to get to as many as possible here. Um, the first question is, can you show us an a, a anterior aesthetic case that you scanned with TRIOS, and would it need additional training? Uh, so I think the best example would be my, um, you know, one of the examples I have, the, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the case for Janine was an anterior aesthetic case. Um, uh, as, as much as I could show you one, it was uh, my hygienist and I was doing her upper centrals and she wanted uh, exactly what she wanted. And there's really no additional training. In fact, the case that I did for Janine was done within one year of me buying the scanner. So that was actually one of my earlier cases. Um, basically learning the basic workflows uh, can let you do a case like that without a problem. All right, someone else wants to know what is emergence profile, what is the emergence profile step when doing a crown for an implant and how do we take an image for that profile? It all starts with the order creation uh, within the dental desktop. So when you create an order to do an implant, uh, it's you'll see on the right side of the screen, you have some optional scans. One of them is a pre-preparation scan. Another one is the emergence profile scan. So when you set up the order, you just click pre-preparation, you click emergence, and that becomes a separate scan that gets built into something that's known as a scan stream. So that very first scan, the pre-preparation scan, is the base scan. And then every scan after that is kind of built on top of that scan. And so when uh, you get to the point, um, there's a workflow bar at the top of the screen, and you basically go next, 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 next. And there's going to be um, a point where it's, it's telling you to take the emergence profile. You basically hold the scanner in there, and you can record the soft tissue. You can record the adjacent contact points of the, of the teeth there. You can also, on that step, uh, capture crown margins on natural teeth that maybe you're doing in conjunction with the implants. Um, so the system does make it pretty, um, pretty user friendly um, so that you can be successful very quickly. Do you typically take your own scans or do your assistants take the scans? And in addition, can anyone else on your staff take a scan? That's a great question. So my assistants are all allowed to take scans. It's, it's basically no different than taking an impression. So if you have a staff member that is certified to take an alginate impression, they can take an intraoral scan for you. That you. They may not be taking the actual scan of the preparation, but they can take your pre-preparation scan. So I have my, my team doing um, my diagnostic scanning. I have them doing scans for, say, night guards or bleaching trays or Essex retainers. In my style of practice, I prefer to actually do the initial scan myself because um, my style of practice is um, uh, such that I'm going to do that first patient visit. Sometimes it's an hour or, or an hour and a half, and, and that's just my style of practice. So I could outsource that to one of my team members. I personally like to do it myself because it gives me a chance to create that connection and the experience and the emotion with the patient very, very quickly. Right away, they see that I'm doing something different than maybe the pre, um, a previous dentist that they've gone to is doing. So I urge you to play with those kinds of things to kind of really find your voice with this. Can you use patient? Can you use patient-specific motion to show the whole mouth, or is it only able to do half of the mouth? You can do it for the whole mouth. You can do it for the whole. When you actually capture it, there are times you're only recording one side, but then when you get to the point. Um, in the software that it runs the video articulation, you, you will see it happening in the whole mouth for sure. Can you remind us what the name of the guided surgery software was that you showed? Implant Studio is a Three Shapes uh, version of preoperative implant planning software. All right, we got time for one more. Okay. Um, we have some people on here that are new Trios users and they love it. Do you recommend using the HD photo feature in place of their intraoral camera or as an adjunct to the camera? Um, so really, I use the HD photo. Um, I use it sometimes. I don't use it all the time. Um, there are times if you have, if you're preparing a tooth for a crown and say there is something that's just not 100% clear, you know, once you've taken the scans, uh, the intraoral trio scans, you can turn on the HD photo feature. You can capture three different um, HD photos. So I would go occlusal, buccal, lingual, 
And then you'll see I showed you it on the onlay um, case where um, on the technician side, they'll see those HD photos overlaid onto your scan. So, so it really does help the enamel kind of pop off the page and it helps the lab kind of see the margin. But truthfully today, um, I don't use that feature a lot for my crowns because when you use, when you get better at preparing teeth and you get really good retraction, you'll see it right there uh, on the screen before you send it. Um, so the, the truth is I use it sometimes, but not all the time. All right, I lied, we're gonna do one more. No problem. Um, how do you avoid scanning your hand when you take the image of the full denture? That's a great, that's a great question too. So it's really just with a little bit of practice. If you watch Valerie's technique, um, she's, she's the one that kind of came up with that. Um, the, the trick is to basically, I'm holding the denture kind of under my hand. Let's just say I'm scanning this remote here, or let's say I'm scanning my phone and this is the scanner. I'm basically rotating the denture like this and my scanner is basically static. And I'm basically being careful not to get my fingers in. And there's a little bit of technique that comes with it. Um, you know, honestly, I think within two or three tries, I got one of those first scans um, of the ones that I showed you, actually. Cool. Well, that will do it for us today. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, for those great answers and for your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. We really do appreciate your time and participation. If you have additional questions that we were unable to answer, or if you'd like to get in touch with a Henry Schein representative to learn more about adding 3Shape to your practice, please visit us at the link shown on your screen. As a thank you for attending today's webinar, you will all receive a link to view the recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Schein and 3Shape, thank you, Dr. Rajan, for an amazing webinar, and thanks so much once again to all of you for attending. Have a great night.